So what I want to do today is I want to start off with the CDF method. So you've all read the book very carefully. You've seen the statement of the theorem. You've seen the change of variable formula from probability. There is a formula you can memorize. I hate memorizing formulas. I, the danger with memorizing a formula is what if you miss something, you know, what if you remember something slightly wrong? And then there's just so many different things. I much prefer to just understand the basics of what's going on, to have an idea of what's out there. So if I need to look something up, I know where to go. You know, I look up CDF method, I look up change of variable formula, and I know what my tools are. I much prefer to understand the broad brush strokes so I can quickly re-derive things if needed. For me, the CDF method, it's so easy to just re-derive from the definition, it's really not worth memorizing this. So what I want to talk about is how to use the CDF method to derive the probability density function of a new random variable from an old random variable. Essentially, the goal here is we take a random variable that we know and we transform it to something else. And the idea is if I know everything about the first one and I understand the method of transformation, I should understand everything about the second one. It's just a function of now just extracting things out in a nice method. So we would call this the CDF method. And we already had a homework problem along these lines. So we start with a random variable x and a nice function g. And so g will take real numbers and spit out real numbers. And we're going to need some assumptions about g. So I will assume g is strictly increasing or it is strictly decreasing on the range of values x hits. So let's say the outputs of x are from 5 to 8. If the outputs of x are from 5 to 8, I only care about g in the range from 5 to 8. I don't care what g is doing anyplace else. I just care about what g is doing from 5 to 8 because I'm going to apply g to x and get a new random variable. So we set y equal to g of x. Then there exists a closed form expression for the density of y as a function of what? What do you think the f density of y is going to depend on? What inputs? What do you think comes into play? I, I'm not asking for the formula. I'm just asking what do you think is going to play a role? X. Uh, not x. Something very closely related to x. Well, I mean, that's where we evaluate this. What do you think this function is going to depend on? f of x, it damn well better depend on f of x, right? Somehow we're transforming from x to y. So at the end of the day, when I get a density for y, it's got to depend somehow on the density of x. Otherwise, wow, no matter what random variable you start with, no matter what transformation you have, it's independent of that initial random variable. So it's got to depend on f of x. What else should it depend on? It should depend on g. You know, if it doesn't depend on g, then again you have the ridiculous situation where no matter what random variable you start with, no matter how you transform it, the end result is independent of the method of transformation. And maybe g inverse. So it seems like it's reasonable to expect. Now, if I say it depends on g, in some sense I've already got for free it depends on g inverse. Because if I know it depends on g, well, g inverse depends on g. And this is the advantage of having a function that's strictly increasing. If my function is strictly increasing, I have an inverse function. I don't always have an inverse function. If, for example, I give you this function for g, and it's constant here, and then it's increasing, this function does not have a nice inverse. The reason it doesn't have a nice inverse is all these values of x get mapped to the same value of y. And so if I want to find the inverse, there's no nice there's no one unique place. So strictly increasing gives inverses. Strictly increasing or decreasing gives a unique inverse. 
OK, so the question is, how will we find the probability density function for y given the probability density function for x? Well, somehow we're going to have to take into account you know, the fact that we know the density of x and we know how we transform. So we're going to use the CDF method. So again, we go back to the definition. The probability that y is at most little y is fy of y, by definition. So again, all these proofs, all these arguments, they always start the same way. They start with the definition. All right, now that I have this, what do I mean? Well, this is the same as the probability that g of x is less than equal to y. OK, and the proof is almost writing itself. What should I do at this point? So I've got the probability of y at most y is the same as the probability that g of x is at most little y. So now we take g inverse of both sides. And the idea is we don't know anything about the density of y, but we know things about the density of x. We want to convert the argument to things about the density of x. So this becomes the same as the probability that x is less equal to g inverse of y. All right, well, now that we have that, this is just fx at g inverse of y. So in general, this is going to be a very hard function to work with. This requires us to do integration. In general, integration cannot be done. It is the great lie of calc 2 that you know, closed form expressions exist for integration. We work very hard to find integrals you can do. In the real world, you actually have to resort to numerical simulations. And later in the semester, we'll talk about Monte Carlo simulations. I'll put some notes on this for the additional reading. Fortunately, we don't need this. We're trying to find the density function. How do we get the density from the cumulative distribution function? I'm sorry? Not integrating the CDF. You're going in the wrong direction. Take the derivative. The, der the CDF gives you the area up to a certain point. It's from integrating. So if we take the derivative, that's giving us the density function. So we get the probability density of y is equal to d by dy of fx of g inverse of y. OK, what rule do we use to take this derivative? Thinking back to calculus. Chain rule. And so just to do this very, very slowly, it's the derivative of this function evaluated g inverse of y times the derivative of g inverse of y. All right, and so just coming over here to write it cleanly, we get the density of y is the density of x evaluated at g inverse of y times the derivative of the inverse function. So a lot of times people give the inverse function a name. People often say, let's let h be g inverse, and then they'll just have an h prime over here. The question is, which is the more natural function? Well, if we're going from x to y, then g is my transform function. And so it doesn't make too much of a difference. One of the big problems whenever you use the chain rule is to remember where to evaluate things. If I'm talking about the density function of y, I have my random variable y, and I want to know what's the probability it takes on a value little y. OK, I want to know the little y. Well, if this is my density function for x, I can't input little y here. Little y might be outside the range. For instance, maybe. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but you know, maybe the density function of x involves the square root. And maybe y is a negative number. Maybe there's some kind of shifting going on. This, could not, this might not even be defined. I need to be evaluating the density function of x at a place where it's defined. It may not be defined at y. So if I want to know what's going on at y, what x gave me that y, g inverse of y. This is a very natural place to, to study this. 
All right, and then this is just basically telling me how things change. It's the little bookkeeping and you know in converting the units. All right, so let's do an example. So I'll do the example that's in the book. I'll just do some of it. Let's take one of the easiest examples possible. X is going to be uniform on 0, 2. So this means the density function of x is equal to 1 half, 0 less equal to x less equal to 2, and 0 otherwise. Let's let g of x be x squared, which is equal to y. So if we wanted to, we could go through and you know, we could just immediately substitute into this formula. I just want to do the calculation slowly, uh, just because in this case we can actually calculate things in closed form. So let's think about what we have here. Is our function g a nice function? Is it strictly increasing? Yeah. At least on the interval 0, 2. If we looked at g over the entire real line, we would have trouble with g in the negative values. It's not going to be strictly increasing over the whole reals, but in the, range, in the region we want to study, everything is fine. So for our example, you know, y equals x squared, we want to calculate you know, the probability that big Y is less than equal to Y. Well, if Y is less than 0, we know the probability is 0. If Y is greater than what, the probability is 1. 1. I'm sorry? 4. So as long as y is greater than 4, we know the answer. So we've already got some of the answer. It's 0 if y is less than equal to 0. It's 1 if y is less than equal to 4. And we don't know what's going on in that intermediate range. So the probability y less than equal to y is the same as the probability x is less than equal to x squared is less than equal to y. This is the same as the probability that x is less than equal to square root of y. Now you can see why I want to break things up a little bit. I don't have to worry, is y negative? If y is negative, I have to worry about the square roots. And the square root of a negative number is not defined in this class right now for problems like this. Well, this is a particularly easy problem. I have a uniform distribution. It would have been much nicer if it was a uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1. It's uniform on 0, 2. So one possibility is I can actually calculate this directly. Or I can write this as, you know, it's f x at square root of y. And it also equals square root of y over um, 2. Why is this the case? My probability density function, its density is 1 half on the interval 0, 2. And so if I want to figure out how much area have I covered, here's 0, here's 2, my density function is always 1 half, you give me some number square root of y, then the area I've covered is square root of y over 2. And as a quick check, if, y, if the square root of y equals 2, I have 1, x and I have all my mass. If square root of y is 0, I have nothing. If square root of y is 1, I have half. So you can do it either way. I can either write down exactly what this is, or I can write down it's my cumulative distribution function evaluated at square root of y. There is a reason I'm choosing this dinky example. I'm choosing this example so we can do it two different ways and compare. In general, we're not going to be in a situation where we know the CDF. But if we happen to be in a situation where we know the CDF, by all means use it. Now let's take the derivative, fy of y, would be the derivative of x, so this becomes little fx at square root of y times d by dy of square root of y. And that equals the derivative of this, which would be 1 over 4 square roots of y. Now this becomes a little bit harder. What's the density function? It's just identically 1 half. It doesn't matter what the input is. The density, it's a uniform on 0, 2. The density is always 1 half. So this part here is just 1 half. And now I'm taking the derivative of square root of y. Oh, that's exactly what I did over here. There's the 1 half. There's the square root of y. You can even recognize the two pieces. And then here, I'll get uh, the derivative of square root of y is 1 over 2 square roots of y. So here is the answer. It's 1 over 4 square roots of y, 
We can replace the question mark now with 1 over 4 square roots of y, 0 less than or equal to y, less than or equal to 4. Does this answer look right to you, 1 over 4 square roots of y? What do you think? Does that look like a probability distribution function? Have I made any algebra mistakes? I tried to do it two different ways, but could I have made an algebra mistake? What do you think? What could we do to check and see if this is reasonable? So we could plug in values, but you know, do you know what the density should be? I mean, so to me, this looks a little surprising. You know, I, I take something really nice like the uniform, I transform it by squaring. What happens is y goes to 0 to the probability density function. As y goes to 0, what happens to the density? It becomes undefined. It goes off to plus infinity. I start off with a really nice uniform random variable. I'm just squaring it, and I'm asking, what's the density of x squared? And it's going off to infinity. As soon as you see an infinity, you should be a little bit worried. What can we do to check and see if this is reasonable? So what properties should a probability distribution function have? So 1 is it integrates to 1. What else? No negative. So we could check 1. Non-negative. Yes. Two integrates to one. Yes, I'll leave that as an exercise to you in integration. It does integrate to one. So this is at least showing that it's reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> if we've made an algebra mistake, the algebra mistakes have canceled. Okay. But again, whenever you do a calculation, you want to try to get a sense of, is this reasonable or not? And you, when I have a probability density function, it's got to be non-negative. It's got to integrate to 1. Let's check that. OK. So this is how you use the CDF method. You can use it for more complicated functions than this. Again, I think it's better to just understand the definition of how you attack this. It is I write the probability of y in terms of the probability of g of x. And then I just differentiate. I don't have to remember the formula. I just have to remember I'm using the chain rule here. In general, instead of square root of y, you'll just have g of x. I'm sorry, g of y. OK, any questions about this? OK, I want to do two clicker questions today. I think we should have time for both of them. So the first is, how many of you know the envelope game? So I took two envelopes. I had Professor Morgan do this, so I have no idea which one is in it. All right. Each envelope contains a dollar amount. Not actual money, of course, you know, just a mathematical representation. All right? One of them contains x, one of them contains twice x. I don't know which one is which. OK? The two amounts have an equal likelihood of being in each envelope. Doesn't matter that one says 389 and one says 317. Professor Morgan did multiple random number generators before he put them in here. I have no idea which one is in which. Our goal is to choose whichever envelope we think of will give us the most money. We can choose and then have second thoughts and choose again and then have second thoughts and choose again. But once we open an envelope, we are committed to it. All right. I will open up the polls. We have like 10 seconds to vote. Envelope that says 317, envelope that says 389. Ready? Go. Which one, which one should we open? The one that says th no, three, seven. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought it would be obvious. One, <laughs> three, seventeen. Two, three, eighty-nine. Three, cannot read. And I'll do, actually, I'll do this as two plus. Anything beyond two. Okay. Polls are still open. We've had two people vote. So should we open the three, seventeen? If you've seen deal or no deal, this is very similar. All right. All right, three more seconds, two more seconds, one more second. I'm closing the polls. This is what they did at the Lucky debate. All right. Oh, give me a. Is there anybody here who didn't vote? Raise your hand if you did not vote. All right. 
I hate to do this to you, but you didn't vote. It's 11 to 11. It's exactly 50% both ways. So I need you to choose in the next four seconds. 389, okay. I thought you were going to say three for a second. I was going, oh, no, okay. So you chose 389. Okay. So I think at least ha okay, half of the remaining people, I think, support your decision, and half, I think, are violently opposed to your choice. All right, so I want to try to prove that you were actually very foolish to say 389. You should have voted the other way, all right? I'm going to use probability because this is a probability class. So you really think 389 is the better choice? Well, here, so. <laughs> Why the choice is bad. All right. So I have two envelopes. One envelope has twice as much as the other. All right. Let's look at the expected return. So say have, I don't know, x dollars in your envelope. If you keep this envelope, how much will you get? X, okay, this is not a hard problem. You have an envelope with X dollars, you keep that envelope, you get X dollars. What if we switch? If switch, half the time we have how much? 2X. And half the time we have 1 half X. So Expected value is one half times two x plus one half times one half x. One half times two is one plus a quarter. So we expect to get one and a quarter, which is one point two five x. How many people want to vote for this one now? Expected value just went up, right? Shouldn't we vote for this one now? Yes? Well, doesn't it matter, like, if I started with that one, then the other one would have a return of 1.25? All right, so now we'll start with this one. And we'll do the same argument all over again. You're right. We should switch back. Now what should we do? All right, switch again. All right, now what? All right, if I was really good, oh, almost. No. If I was, you know, no, I'll stop. Should have practiced. All right, so we would just basically keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth all day long. What's wrong? Where do things break down? I mean, our expected value is positive by switching. We go from expecting X dollars to 1.25X. And then you can get infinite money. Yes, yes. <laughs> What's wrong? This is a nice example of conditional probability. You know, I have two possibilities. I'm doing my chair. Half the time I'm here, half the time I'm here. Where is the mistake? It's that if you, if you, well, no, if you have some way of knowing that you have the one that has twice as money, are you not? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't have any way of knowing anything. Isn't this kind of like a one-time thing, and you're, you're looking at the average like, value of the money? It's not a one-time thing. Try one more, one more attempt. Using two different x's. What two different x's? So like you can only double one value or have the other value. But you're taking them as one x, so then you're getting one point two five x. Not quite. The difficulty here is I'm assuming that I have two numbers, you know, x and two x, or x and x halves, y and two y, it doesn't matter what I call them. How am I choosing the numbers? I'm trying to give you the impression that I'm choosing the numbers uniformly so that all numbers are equally likely. We just talked a moment ago, this is a well thought out connected lecture. We just did the uniform distribution not on 0, 1, but on 0, 2, where the density was 1 half. Can we put a uniform random variable on the whole real line? No, we can't. So I can't choose all the numbers equally likely. So if I choose one number x, depending on its size, x over 2 might be far more likely. Or maybe 2x is far more likely, depending on where we are and depending on the distribution. 
So the difficulty lurking here, this calculation is right, but the assumption that we're choosing numbers uniformly on the entire reals, that's wrong. All right, for the record, if we had opened 389, we would have gotten x. No idea if that's even visible. And if we had opened 317, we would have gotten 2x. So we were right to switch, and you were wrong to have chosen 389. <laughs> OK. So the second one I wanted to just briefly do. Yes. Yes. OK, th this one over here? Yeah, sorry. OK. So the, the thing you do all the expression for at the top is the, the, the CDF function? Oh, sorry. Yes, you're right. Th this should be, thank you. Um, this should be, thank you. FY of Y, thank you. Yes. Oh, no, wait, no. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, th I'm sorry. This one, okay, the probability y less than equal to square root of less than equal to y. And then over here, I, I was plugging in the density. I should not be plugging in the density. I should be leaving this as one half square root of y. Thank you. Because that's what we calculated the CDF of y was. Then the density is going to be one over four square roots of y for y between zero and one, and then zero otherwise. Thank you. OK. All right, so I was preparing whoops, the next part of the lecture with Kim and Kayla. And so how many of you have heard of the marriage or the secretary problem? Let's see if this works. Uh, so unfortunately, every time I plug the computer in, uh, I lose all the sound. <laughs> but no, it's, I mean, I'll, I'll plug this in just so, but it doesn't matter. Uh, for, so, for some reason, it, the computers don't like to. It's also muted. It's muted? Yeah. Okay. Corner. I'll try unmuting it. But I, I, I tried unmuting it as well. No, it doesn't like to do the sound. I, I was depressed to realize that most of you probably were not alive. In fact, many of you, if not all of you, were probably not alive when this movie came out. How many of you at least have seen this movie? So for those of you who are trying to watch this on the blurry screen, this is Aladdin. Okay? What scene am I doing? Prince Ali. So the marriage problem or the secretary problem works as follows. You have a person who gets to choose, and they get to see the candidates one at a time. And when they see each candidate, they can either accept or reject. And if they reject, the person is not available again. No backsliding, no second chances. If, they say, if you say no, the person is just so overcome with grief, they kill themselves and remove themselves from all future consideration. All right, if you do not want them, they do not want to live anymore. Life just has no worth. There's no chance of going back. Once you say no, it is final. Okay. So what's going on in this scene? Who remembers the movie Aladdin? All right, I'll, I'll get rid of the math, but the math is actually important to find. What's going on in the scene? Yes? He's, he's just wished for an incredible amount of wealth so that he can impress the princess. So he can impress the princess, and then w what happens? The princess gets to choose. She's been looking at suitors all throughout the movie. And she says either yes or no to the suitor. And in fact, at the end of this, you know, he then meets her, and she says no. Uh, somebody was sending me some interesting stories on the news today. Indian bride walks out of wedding when groom fails math test. <laughs> so the story was uh, the bride tested the groom on his math skills, and when he got so long, she walked out. How much is 15 plus 6 is? Why 17? She claimed she was misled as to how educated he was. So the whole point is you know, if you ever do get into a situation like this where you have to make decisions, I want to try to help you. So when you ask, you know, one of the questions they ask at the end of the semester is, you know, what was this class good for, broader impact, or stuff like this? I have told you one of my students has promised he's going to use this to determine whom he marries. He is still single. <laughs> so you're going to see objects one at a time, and you have to decide when you want to 
uh, commit and you know pull the trigger. Once you commit, no going back. Okay. So let's imagine you have n people. You can always compare people to the other people you've seen. This person is better, this person is worse. But you do not know ahead of time the distribution that people are being drawn from as to what is your top candidate. So you know, if the perfect person walks in, you may not realize that they're perfect until you see later on, oh, that was the best. So the question is, once you say no to someone, they can't come back. What is your probability if you adopt the best strategy that you end up with the best person. I will consider anything else a failure. Okay? I will not answer questions about my marriage or selections while it's being recorded. I will answer those questions after class. <laughs> but we will consider a success only if you get the optimal person. Okay? If you get the second best person out of a million, that is considered as bad as getting the worst person. Okay? This is an unreasonable assumption, but this problem has applications in economics, so this is reasonable for us. Okay? Here are the options. One, 100%. So your probability of getting the best person is one. Two, 50%. Three, one over 2,015. Four, one over the log of n. Five, one over the square root of n. Six, one over n. Seven, 1 over n squared, 8, 0. Okay? These are your options. All right, I will open the polls. What do you think your probability of ending with the best person? 1, a half, 1 over 2015. Which one do you think is closest? It's okay to go over. Which one do you think is the closest probability? So again, think of n as a billion people. You're interviewing a lot of people for this position. Looks like your method is much more tiny. Not saying. The optimal. If you use the optimal strategy, we will talk about what the optimal strategy is in a moment. What do you think the best you can do is? Okay, do you think you can get 100% of the time right? Or do you think the best you can get is 0%? What do you think is the best? And you know nothing about them, so you can't. You just, you just see them as they come in one at a time. Are polls, open? polls are open. Four people have voted. We have 13 seconds left, 12 seconds left. What do you think is your best probability? What do you think is closest? This is hard. Two seconds left, quickly vote. All right. So we had 10% here, 5% here, 0% here, 20% here, 20% here. Twenty percent here. Uh, a, a, B, C, D. E. Okay, so then this would be twenty-five percent here. Uh, Ten percent here. Ten percent here. All right. So before doing the analysis, I want to talk about how we can eliminate some of the possibilities. Which number can we eliminate? Zero. We can eliminate zero. Can you give me a strategy that does better than zero percent? Choosing the first person, choosing the second person, choosing any specified person. What's the probability of that strategy working? One over n. So we know it can't be eight, we know it can't be seven. Six is still in the game. The hope is maybe we can do a little bit better than just randomly choosing one person. That maybe by looking at a couple of the candidates, we can get some sense of the pool. And then once we know a little bit about the pool, then go from that and make a better informed decision. So the question is, which one of these is better? How far up can we go? And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about a strategy. And so it's going to look as follows. In the interest of time, I'm not even going to try to draw well. All right. We have n people. <coughs> we're going to look at the first k people. And we're going to use the first k people to get some sense of what the space looks like. And then we're going to take the first person better than the best we've seen. Okay? Take first person better than the best in the first K. K 
Can you tell me a danger of this strategy? Yep, if your best person is in the first K, you lose. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, it seems like a good strategy for large accounts. So K can be sufficiently large as well for so small relatives. Good, so do, we, so do we think K is a universal constant or do we think K depends on N? K probably depends on N. The more candidates we have, the more time we need to spend to get a sample of the space. Now again, there's a lot of applications to problems like this. I love the idea of trying to figure out uh, you know, what the relative size of k should be as a function of n. The other problem is, what if we don't know n? So I had a student give a really nice colloquium many years ago on Valentine's Day on this subject where, what if you don't know how many candidates you have? How do you choose a strategy? What if you have maybe some idea, maybe n is a random variable drawn from a certain distribution? Lots of fun stuff we can get into. Anybody ever watch Mad TV? They had a skit years ago called Lowered Expectations. Uh, it's basically the last resort dating service. So in a problem like this, if you're in through here, you're probably willing to keep going. As you get very close to the end, however, you start worrying about, well, who am I going to end up with? I'm going to end up with the nth person if I don't choose anything. So in terms of trying to generalize and make this a really tough problem, if you want to start interpreting, well, what if I'm happy with just maybe maximizing my expectation? What do I want to do? When do I want to bail and just make a decision? Let's analyze what happens if we take the first person better than the best in the first K. We want to calculate what is the probability we end up with the correct person. All right, and again, for us, the correct person is the best. If I end up with the second best, I consider that a failure. I consider that as bad as ending up with the worst possible. All right. So. Case L, best person, actually let me do case M. M is easier for me to write than M. You know, best person is in spot M. So the probability we win given the best in M is equal to what? We know the answer in some cases. For what values of M do we know the answer? Actually, if m is less than or equal to k. So if m is less than or equal to k, the probability is 0. The difficulty now is, well, what happens if the best person is beyond k? OK. Probability we win best in m, m is greater than k. So now let's think about how we're going to win. So here's k, here's m, here's n. Here's the best person. How can we win? Uh, so long as all the people between K and M are worse than the best person before K. Yeah, OK, so we need, so here's M minus 1. Here's 1. So in these M minus 1 people, we need the best of these is in the first K. So if the best of the first, I'm sorry, yes. So if the best of the first M minus 1 people is in the first K, we see them and the first person better is going to be person M. So if the, if the best person is before k, then the first person we see better than them is at m, and we win. If that best person is in through here, they'll be better than the best person we see in here, and we would have selected them inappropriately. So this is how we win. We need of the m minus 1 people, the best of these is in the first k. What's the probability that happens? So what's the probability that the best of the first m minus 1 people is in the first k? Excellent. K over M minus 1. The people are randomly ordered. So even though in the two-envelope problem I was telling you the uniform distribution is not appropriate, here it is. I'm assuming everybody is equally likely to be in every slot. 
I want the best person to be in one of the first k slots. I have m minus 1 possibilities. The probability I land in the first k is k over m minus 1. So now that we know this, we can calculate the probability we win is going to be a sum. m goes from 0 to n. And now it's going to be probability we win given the best is an m times the probability best is an m. Right. Well, we don't have to worry about the sum all the way up to k, because that's just 0. So I just have to sum m goes from k plus 1 to n. The probability we win is k over m minus 1. And what's the probability the best is an m? 1 over n. So I can pull out a k over n, and I get k over n, and then I have a sum of m goes from k plus 1 to n of 1 over m minus 1. So this is k over n, and I'm going to have a sum m goes from 1 to n minus 1 of 1 over m minus the sum m goes from 1 to, let me see if I can do this correctly, to k. So the, the sum starts here with a 1 over k plus 1 minus 1 with a 1 over k. So if I've done this correctly, that's my sum. And so I'm basically extending the sum all the way down to 1, and then I'm subtracting off what I extended. And I'm just shifting, so instead of having m minus 1, I have m. Okay? So just after you do some algebra, this is what we get. And the reason I can write this is, now I have, what sum is this? You've hopefully seen this sum before. Not geometric. The sum of 1 over m. Oh. Geometric would be like r to the m. It's the harmonic. It's the harmonic. It's the harmonic. So this is approximately the log of n minus 1. This is approximately the log of k minus 1. So we get that this is approximately k over n, the log of n minus 1 over k minus 1, or just in the interest of time, k over n, the log of n over k. Okay? So this is just using the harmonic series. And so we're using... The sum m goes from 1 to x of 1 over m is about log of x. You can add additional terms. You can do a better approximation. We've got about five minutes left to figure out who we should marry. We don't have time for this. All right? We're going to cut a few corners. But if you want to do a more careful analysis, and you figure that it's better to do a more careful analysis on the math than on people's characteristics, we should talk. All right. We have, this is the log of x. By breaking the sum, going, instead of going from k to n, by breaking going from 1 to n and then 1 to k, we now have two harmonic sums that we understand. And so we get the probability of a win is equal to k over n log of, I'm sorry, is it k, uh, n over k. So what do we do to find the best choice? How do we find the best choice? How do we optimize? Yes? We want to maximize. That. We want to maximize, yes. Yeah. Very important, you want to maximize, not minimize. How do we do that? Uh, well, you find the k value that maximizes. Good. How do we find the k value? You take the derivative So, critical points and endpoints. Not surprisingly, the endpoints are foolish. If you take k equals 1, you've got 1 over n, essentially. the Very bad, very, very, very bad. Or maybe k is 0. I don't really care. If you take k equals n, okay, 1 over here, that's really good. But now you've got the log of 1, which is 0. <coughs> so the endpoints will be out. So we have to take critical points. So let's let f of x be x over n log of n over x. So it's 1 over n x log n minus x log x. If we take the derivative, we get f prime of x is 1 over n. The n doesn't really matter. The derivative of x log n is just log of n. Now we take the derivative of x log x. Product rule, we get log of x. 
And now when we take the derivative log of x, we get 1 over x. So we get minus x times 1 over x, which is 1. Anybody know a really good way to write 1? What's a good way to write 1? No, not log of 0. Close. Log of log of e. Because I've got log log. I can combine logs. Let's write that as the log of e. We get f prime of x is 1 over n, the log of n over x e. And we want this to equal 0, so that tells us n over x e has to equal one. The log of one is zero. That tells us that x, you know, our critical value, is equal to n over e. And when we plug that in at k equals n over e, this gives us the probability of a win. So if k is n over e and we're dividing by n, that gives us a one over e. And then n divided by k is just going to become e. The log of e is 1. The probability of a win is 1 over e. OK? This is shocking. This is correct. You can, what should you do to check this method? What can we do to check this? Simulation, simulation right? Miller loves simulation. Write a code. Have it look at a thousand people. Have it look at a hundred thousand people. You know, randomly sort the numbers. Randomly choose which one is the best. And say, I'm going to look at the first n over e. And you know, one over e, I always forget exactly. It's 36.7, 36.8%. 36 so it's roughly 36.7%. This is phenomenal. Better than a third of the time, you will end with the top candidate by just looking at a small subset and taking the first one better. Yes? How, what's the probability that you, with this strategy you'd get in like the top 10%? Great, great question. And so that would be a great project to do is to see if you all, if, there's a difference between being in the top 10 and being in the top 10%. Top 10% is very strong. Didn't we not make k be an integer? Yeah, I mean, so you take k to be the nearest integer to this. It's, it's going to tweak it by a very small amount if n is large. Like, does it, it doesn't work for every n, right? It works for one. I mean, th this, is, this is for n large. So, you know, again, I'm using these approximations that this harmonic sum is approximately log of x. I need x to be somewhat large for this. So I need you guys to do a lot of dating. <laughs> but not too seriously, because if it's too serious, then you're not going to get enough data points for us. I'm sorry? It does not depend on n, although k depends on n. So if there was no independence anywhere, it would be shocking. But the limiting probability. Now what you could ask is, as a function of n, how close are we coming? And there should be some approach to that, maybe like at the rate of 1 over n or something like that. There will be some independence there. But it's a universal constant. It's 1 over e. You see e and 1 over e in numerous places. See, I think this would have been a much better question for the bride to ask the prospective groom in India. You know, what is the probability you are the right person for me? But this should shock you. If this doesn't shock you, you know, again, the rest of the semester is hopeless. 36.7% right. chance of the best candidate just by looking at the first couple and doing first one better. And there's no better strategy. This is the best strategy. Okay. So have fun at dances and 